Um, this is a little bit of an overview of what we're going to talk about today. I really want to start off my research presentation with defining a couple of things for you guys, starting with the endocrine system. The endocrine system are, is composed of the glands and organs that deliver hormones directly into the bloodstream, bloodstream and deliver them all over the body. An EDC, or an endocrine disrupting chemical, is a natural or human-made chemical that can affect the levels of the natural hormones in the body. And lastly, a farm worker for this presentation is considered someone that's a farm laborer, so not anyone in a managerial position, um, but someone that either harvests or picks the crop. Um, and then many pesticides are labeled as EDCs. So why this matters to us is because the U.S. has had an increased use of pesticides just to keep up with the demand, um, since the United States is, a world's top, is, one, is the world's top food exporter. Um, to, they, agriculture contributes 1.6 trillion to the U.S.'s GDP per year. To keep up with this demand, pesticide use has increased as well in comparison to the rest of the world. This matters because pesticide use affects um, the body, exposure to the pesticides affects the body in many different ways, such as dermatological, carcinogenic, and neurological. But most importantly, the topic I will be talking about today, reproductive and, and, and endocrine effects. To start off with, I do want to define a healthy, what a healthy cycle looks like. So a healthy cycle usually lasts two to three has a two to seven day period um, where you're actually menstruating with a moderate flow. Um, an estimated, but an estimated 14 to 25 percent of menstruating individuals have menstrual irregularities. Um, shown here are some of the common uh, menstrual irregularities found in the population. So these menstrual irregularities are carried with two factors. First, a genetic factor. So genes can mutate the way that organs are regulated, and these organs can be the ones that are regulating the menstrual cycle. And then environmental factors come into play when it comes to EDCs, and EDCs, um, the exposure to them and the length that you're exposed to them can affect your genetics, your genetics and then affect the way that um, your menstrual cycle occurs. Um, so these two are really correlated, but the people that fall in between these two factors are actually farm workers. Farm workers are exposed to both of these factors on a daily basis, both in where they live and where they work. So the reason why my research is important is because of this um, quote right here. Um, farm laborers and children are vulnerable populations due to their constant exposure um, to pesticides. Despite this, their generational effect has little research. Um, exposures to endocrine disrupting chemicals like pesticides can lead to long-term effects and a predisposition to endocrine disorders. This study aims to research the role of EDCs, their amplification for each generation, and their alteration in menstrual cycle characteristics. My research questions included, how does a previous ancestral occupational exposure to various pesticides affect a woman's menstrual cycle and associated reproductive disorders? I also asked, does time, does time involved in our cultural work matter, and do exposures affect even the third generation? Our hypothesis was that there would be a higher prevalence of menstrual irregularities irregular the longer someone worked in agricultural work. To do this, we conducted an online survey um, with up to 42 questions depending on how you answered, um, if you were involved in agriculture or if you weren't. These questions covered information about the menstrual cycle, workplace practices, the frequency of exposure to pesticides, the duration that you were exposed to pesticides, and the different types that you were exposed to. Menstrual characteristics included cycle length, regularity, and symptom severity. We took a quantitative approach to this design um, with a focus on female sign up birth subjects, um, specifically focusing on children of farm laborers to examine if there was a discernible pattern consistent with previous literature. From our demographics, we found that um, 24 belonged to the control group, which was just female sign up birth participants, and 17 belonged to an art cultural group, meaning that they themselves were around here in our culture. Here you can see um, these two different charts break down age and then break down an average annual income. With age, we expected to get a, a larger population of the 18 to uh, 24 population. So this is the college, the traditional college age, which the emails were going to be sent out to and the social media platforms were going to be geared toward, toward. So that was expected. Um, a surprising thing was that more than 60% of my population that had worked in agriculture fell below the poverty line for a family of four. Um, in my population of interest, uh, nine participants uh, identified themselves as having worked in the field, four, 
11 identified a parent having worked in a field, and 14 identified either a parent having worked in a field. These were not mutually exclusive, so you could belong in one category as well as the other. And here we have a little bit of the reproductive disorders that um, participants identified. The first four are the ones where agriculture was just the agricultural population was disproportionately represented. Um, the specifically important is that infertility one. Um, it shows that 75% of those that, that identified as having infertility issues were from the agricultural population, which is a really high disproportionate amount of people. To analyze all this data, um, we have to take qualitative questions and be able to um, analyze it. So we created a menstrual dysfunction score to have a consistent measure of which to analyze a dysfunction in a menstrual cycle. So we took the length of a period as well with, with how many how much blood flow they had, as well as any self-identified menstrual dis uh, disruptions to form the menstrual dysfunction score. Consistent with literature, we did find that the MPS goes up with age. There is a small gap dip in the 36 to 45, um, but generally it does go up. And this can just be because of due to life, lifelong exposure to EBCs that just can accumulate on one another. Next to this is the MDS, the MDS average of the agricultural population compared to the control population. Um, as expected, the agricultural population is a little bit higher. Um, my reasoning as to why there wasn't just a bigger gap is because those that answered the survey that were part of the control group may be already predisposed to endocrine disorders since the only incentive to answering the survey was just to have better um, health women's health research, so they would be incentivized to answer the survey. So that can explain why there's just a little bit of a gap there. Um, but one of our most significant results was that the higher MPS, the higher MPS scores were than those that have worked in agriculture the longest. Um, this is consist consistent with literature because the longer you're exposed to pesticide use, the more different pesticides are interacting with one another. And we can also see the generational effect of this as all the participants that had been working in agriculture for more than five years have had either a parent or grandparent working in agriculture. Um, this followed our hypothesis that there would be a generational effect. So um, just reiterating here, um, those who worked in agriculture for more than five years had a disrupted menstrual cycle compared to those that have worked in agriculture less than five years, and infertility was present in this agriculture population. This just shows the need for further research in agriculture population, as well as a higher responsibility for employers as to what pesticides they are exposing their workers to. Um, future research um, would include something on age, as you saw that that there's a ch the chart there, there was an increase in age um, and there was an increase in the, the MPS score. So I would also like to look into that, as well as specifically regions such as Salinas Valley, California, that's a very highly pesticide exposed region. region. I would like to look more at that population and see if there's um, patterns there. Um, so limit limitations to the survey was the sample size. I did get 60 respond 65 respondents, but only 41 of those responses were viable data that I could work with and only 17 were part of the agriculture population. So in future research, I would like to have a larger sample size to be able to see more characteristics and patterns. Um, another limitation were, there were some broad questions asked in this um, study, but that just shows that um, there's little research already to base the study off of. And um, my research project is one of the first one that just focuses on generational impacts of EDCs. So my questions were a little broad, but in future research, I would like to narrow down now that I know uh, what characteristics and patterns are present and also the time the survey was live, was live. As mentioned before, this was, was just an eight week program. Um, so the survey was only live for about three weeks. So we expect that if it's uh, live for a longer period of time, we can might get more respondents. Um, and I wanna close um, my research project by really touching on this quote here. Um, they weren't aware about what pesticide was and all the harm it could cause them. They were just going home to make that, um, money for their families. Awareness and informed consent is missing in the agricultural community with agricultural workers. Even if there is consent, um, these people are only are forced to be exposed to EDCs because that is the only way of living. Um, this research can help inform lawmakers and employers the dangers of constant exposure and will hopefully create a better experience for farm workers or the altogether ban of certain, character, of certain pesticides that are high toxins for the human body. Um, for this project, I would like to thank the McNair program for all of their support. Um, I've been in the McNair program for about three years, and every year I just receive so much support from everyone. 
Um, I would like to, tell you, to thank Dr. Emily Hills uh, for all her guidance and all her support, as well as my family and friends for um, encouraging me throughout those long nights of research. Um, and I'm now open for questions. Um, so actually this project made me think a lot about like what I want to go into and I think I want to go into hormone research and um, specifically these underrepresented um, communities. Uh, I always talk about how this project is kind of like my culminating point of, of my senior early career because um, as a double major history and people are around science, it seems like there's no kind of connection there. Um, but with this project itself there was because history has shown that this is an underrepresented group that has been continuously oppressed. And, now we can see it in the ways that it's affecting our own and their biological um, behaviors. So this project is kind of just like a culmination of everything that I've studied, um, and it's going to show me where I've been studying this. Is there anything that like, inspired your idea that you wanted to focus on, on the um, Yeah, so my parents worked in agriculture work as well, and I'm part of the CAMP program here, the College of System and Learning program. Um, so just talking to my peers, I felt like a lot of us, uh, we were talking about, just, just in talking, we would come up with like menstrual regularities, and I thought that I was curious that we were being discussed um, to, like a lot of us came from my different communities, and then we all had these uh, irregularities. And then I started working in the lab at UT, and I was, uh, I learned about EDCs and the effects that they could have on the body, and so I was just, then I started thinking about pesticides and menstrual regularities. Um, one of the most shocking, or it was really just interesting, is that in no circumstances was there a circumstance where only a parent worked in agriculture. So it seems like working in agriculture is either means that your grandparent also worked in agriculture or you yourself have worked. So it just ties back to that generational exposure. People that are in this kind of work tend to be in it for a longer period of time. So it can just be generational. So I think that was pretty interesting to know. Like, what is the effect of having a parent working in the field? Um, so, the effect would be like just genetic. Your, if your parent is exposed to EDCs, this would be changing the way that their body is functioning, and could later they could later pass it down to you. Um, specifically, this would be most important during a, like a perinatal period, where um, if your mother is like pregnant with you around the time she's exposed to EDCs, um, it's more likely that, that that EDC will transpose like the the blood brain barrier and the placenta and be able to pass down to you. Um, so that's why it's really important as to the time period that your parents being exposed to EDCs. Um, and then just after that, if it's um, we, if we see an effect in the third generation, that's extra important because it shows that it wasn't just your parent passing it down to you, but now it's something continuing in your bloodline after. 